Um, we're very pleased to welcome here today four guests, two with four legs and two with two. Um, so the bay horse in front with the branding on his right shoulder is A-Rod, who we're going to talk about first, who's trained by David Simcock here. Please give you a round of applause to Dave. No more applauses. I think no more applause after that. Um, and the other horse is a chestnut uh, called Style Hunter, who is trained by John Gosden, who is standing up here as well. No applause for him, I think is very appropriate. Quite right. Um, quite right, exactly. Okay, so what we're going to do, these, these are going to continue uh, their way around. We'll just talk about A-Rod very briefly in terms of where he came from and where he started his life. So he has got a good pedigree. I think it's fair to say that if you imagine that page with him as a young horse, without his form at the top of it, i.e. you take A-Rod and all that he has achieved out of the top of that pedigree, he's actually got a very nice page as it is. Under the third dam was a horse that I can remember when I was a kid called Actalak. Okay, he was owned by Sheikh Hamdan al Maktoum. He's one of the first horses that the Arabs owned uh, that actually um, achieved a Group 1 win. And Actalak, many of you remember, he was um, trained in the UK and then in Australia by the late, great Colin Hayes. Um, and he actually led Dancing Amazing. Brave and Sharistani around Tattenham Corner in their derby of 1986 uh, and did well over here before going off to Australia where, of course, he won the Melbourne Cup. So there is an influence for stamina in that pedigree, um, and uh, there's plenty of quality in the pedigree. A-Rod himself, in my humble opinion, is very much of the sire. He's a son of Teofilio, who is the son of Galileo, who was trained by Jim Bolger as a two-year-old. I think he was joint champion two-year-old with Holy Roman Emperor in his year, and then he went wrong and never ran at three. He himself is a big, big boy, Teofilio. He's 16, three, going on 17 hands. Uh, the, the, the rumor was at the time uh, that he had had a skeletal issue, and then we later discovered that he had some wind problems, Teofilio, which is no surprise because he himself is a big, big, powerful horse. Uh, and he's passed that on to this boy. Uh, and we are, and I think that, you know, Dave, bring in David now if we can. Um, he, he, he himself, when we're buying these horses at the sales, and I ought to point out that, that David and I don't often hook up in this ring. It's normally my business partner, Richard Brown, and, and David who, who buy horses together. Um, but we're, we can be a bit we're wary of Teofilio because of wind, can't we? Very much so. It's... Um Stallions tend to get reputations um, for certain traits, and wind with Teofilio is, uh, is definitely one people are nervous of. Um, this horse is very clean winded, in fact, um, and he will have had a wind test and he will have been scoped when he went through the ring at Goffs back in 2012. Um, and he hasn't had a wind problem at all all his life. And the fact that he's still racing at sevens is a credit to the horse. Yeah, he's very tough and sound. He's got a great shoulder. He's got a great backside. <clears throat> His hind action is now very much of a, of a horse in training. You know, he's, this horse has been around the block. He's seven years old now, turning eight. So just to, just to recap his sales history, so he was sold as a yearling in Goffs for 170,000 euros, uh, which had been a good price for a tier filio at the time. Uh, he was bred by Rathbury Stud in Ireland, which is a very, very good nursery indeed for young flat racing stock. And um, he was bought by David Redvers on behalf of Sheikh Farhad Altani, who races under Qatar Racing. Now, this horse um, started his career where he's had three different trainers. Peter Chapelheim, he started life with as a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And when he was in training at four, he also went off to uh, Australia. And then he came back to Pete. And then he went back to Australia for a longer period where he was trained by Chris Waller. And then he came back to, uh, to David Simcock after that. And then he came back through this sales ring earlier this year where Richard Brown, my partner, bought him for 145,000 guineas here and he's now owned by a partnership 
um, which intends to race him on uh, through next year. So why, why don't we talk a little bit about his... Should we just rewind the clock a little bit? Because although, obviously, we aren't Pete Chappelheim, we both know Pete well, and we can remember this horse when he was a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and he was a very much a one-time derby, so, derby horse, wasn't he? Yeah, basically, there's, there's, there's four stories, if you like, to this horse. Um, the original story was he was thought of as a derby horse. Um, he won his maiden in his three-year-old career, in April of his three-year-old career. He then went on to finish second in the Dante, which is a, probably the best of all the derby trials. Um, and then he went to the derby. Didn't stay. Didn't stay. Ran a creditable fourth, um, but didn't get home. And that's probably the end of... I'm going to interrupt you there, if you don't mind, very briefly. Just to say that if you look at the page, they're going to think... When you're running into running a horse in a derby trial and in a derby, this is from a management point of view, not from a training point of view. <clears throat> you're going to think this horse is by Teofilio, who's by Galileo, by Sadlers. Galileo won the derby, Sadlers, Wellside, Derby winners, and Oaks winners, and middle distance horses galore. The downside, uh, the, the, the names on that page will suggest that, he, that she is going to throw to speed. Um, Blushing Groom famously ran in, in the derby and didn't stay behind the minstrel. And Near F was a champion miler. Rahi is somewhat of an influence for both. Uh, but as, as David pointed out to me when we were running through this beforehand, the dam won over six furlongs as a two-year-old and never did anything else. So there's more speed than they thought coming from below, isn't there? Absolutely. So the second stage of his story is, is basically, as a four-year-old, he was revamped as a miler. Um, he, he won the Diamond at Epsom over a mile half a furlong. Um, he was second in the Sussex Stakes, which is one of the premier mile races of the year. And then he went on, I think he was second to Salah that day, who was, who was champion miler that particular year. Um, in his five-year-old career, he then went on to, again, be a miler, but they tried him over six furlongs in the July Cup, and that didn't work out. And basically, at this stage, they are trying to make him a stallion. Um, he's a Group 2 winner, he's Group 1 placed, and he probably needs to win a Group 1 to, to become a stallion. Um, he obviously just came up short over a mile, and he's not a slow horse, as we have found out, and they tried him over six levels in the July Cup, but he wasn't quite quick enough. It's then looking for the next option. What do I do next with the horse? Um, and this is where Australia came into the equation. Um, it's probably a slight level down, as stallions wise, and if you made it, became a group one horse in Australia, you could probably stand there. Uh, he ran two respectable races there, but unfortunately, his form tailed off and it didn't really work for him. And hence the branding he's got on uh, his right side. Um, there's a little number there which they have to have when they go to Australia. And then fortunately for me, when he came back from Australia, he came to me. Um, he looked poor. Um, he looked like he hadn't done, suffered in quarantine slightly. And then it's a rebuilding exercise. Um, he's at the age of six by this stage, and he's probably best his past his best, but um, he's still very capable. Uh, he was fifth in the wood by mile. He won a listed race. He's been second in a listed race, and the plan now is to race internationally. Um, he was due to go to America in two weeks' time, but that's been um, cancelled. He, he struck into himself in his last race, and he'll head to Dubai this spring, and he's got three stakes races out there, and uh, we'll have some fun with him. This, this is a big, strong, mature horse, hence why he's now got a great neck on him with a bit of, you, you could argue he's a bit thick of his neck, but he's a big, big, mature horse. That's perfect. So standing, looking at him here, he's, he's, he's big, he's strong, he's powerful, he's got a great shoulder, he's got a great forearm, he's got a lovely head on him, very typical Sadler's Wells line markings, you know, bright bay with a little bit of white on his face and, and feet. He's pretty, pretty good through the foreleg. He's a bit flat through the knee. When we talk about horses being back at the knee, it has a, a degree of concaveness to it. And when they're over at the knee, it's forward. Most of us prefer a little bit of back at the knee. Uh, trainers probably don't because they're putting pressure 
behind the knee onto tendons. And this is, you know, he is a very correct horse, this. And when you're standing on head on, when we're looking at horses at the sales, we're not just looking for good confirmation and good action, we're looking for correctness. And this horse is pretty correct. He's just starting to pigeon toe his near four, but that's just an age thing more than anything else. Um, and you can see why I made 170,000 um, euros as a yearling. Um, and he's just a thoroughly well put together horse. And just out of interest, since you've had him, obviously, you know, an older horse is going to have, you know, soundness issues, maintenance issues. There's quite a lot of wear and tear. What, what, how have you had it? Found him leg-wise in training? Um, he's been very straightforward, actually. Um, he came back from Australia with a. He'd, he'd gone through a fence in Australia, had a terrible gash, got a scar on his hind leg. Um, we do help him along occasionally. Um, you know, they, as they're getting older, they get more arthritic, and we will just, if you like, give them an oil, him an oil change in his knees. Um, we'll take a little bit of fluid out, and the viscosity of that fluid becomes quite liquid, and we just replace it. Um, so it thickens up, if you like, and it's like a fresh set of oil going well in done. there, and the pistons start working again very well. Um, it's a little bit of tinkering, but basically he's a very sound horse. He's what I call a light trainer. Um, he doesn't want to overtrain. The fresher he is, the better he is. You let one race leading him into another. So you allow him to need that first race to get him fit for the second race, if you like. Um, and because he's an old horse, you don't want to bully him anyway. So I'm quite happy to do that as long as the owners are and they're prepared that we might get a little tired in the last half furlong. Um, you know he's going to be better next time. And that happens an awful lot. You know, as, as punters, which many of you are, we don't have them as fit as a fiddle all the time. You know, one race generally leads into another. Um, so, but no, he's a, he's a very kind horse. As you can see, he's got a great temperament, um, which is huge when it comes to traveling abroad. And um, he's a horse that the new syndicate will all enjoy. And hopefully they'll get a, a few days in the sun in, uh, in January and February. And hopefully, um, because he's still in tar, one day as a, a stallion job, hopefully at the end of next year, it's obviously old for him to do that job, but you never know. Likely to be abroad, not in England, because he probably wouldn't be commercial enough, but there are lots of other countries, stand stallions, and he'll probably find a little job um, somewhere else. Brilliant, thank you very much. David. Moving on to the second horse here, the Chestnut. So this is Style Hunter. He's by Raven's Pass out of a deep impact mare. Um, and that's of interest to you pedigree gurus this year, because of course there's been uh, two um, very well-bred horses that have done well this year by Deep Impact, who is the champion star of Japan. So just a bit of background on him. So he's by Sunday Silence. Um, and he raced in the States, uh, Sunday Science, but he was so upright, i.e. vertical, through his front leg that they couldn't, no one wants him in America, so they sold him to Japan, um, where he sired uh, Deep Impact, who's out of a very good mare that was owned by the Nagel family um, uh, and trained by the late John Hills, and the Yoshida's ball wind in her hair, took her off to Japan, made it at a Sunday silence, and got Deep Impact, uh, who is literally the best stallion there. So I, the, this, the reason why I know a little bit of background of this horse, just before we go on to how, how John bought him as a yearling with us, um, so Sunday Best, I was dispatched by the breeder, which is Chase Moore Farm, Andrew Black, who made his money out of Betfair. And he wanted to diversify a little bit out from just regular European uh, bloodlines. So he, he put me on a plane to Japan, and I didn't know what on earth I was doing because uh, I'd never been there in my entire life. And so I hooked up with a, a guy who came recommended by John Magna called Harry Sweeney, who's an Irish guy who's made his living out of uh, breeding and rearing horses in Japan, which I think was, is, is a pretty amazing thing to do to, to, to bring horsemanship to a, to a place like that with the language barrier. Pretty amazing achievement. So anyway, I arrived there, and we were going to try and buy some deep impact filly foals. And at that stage, the horse was very much in his infancy. He was starting to have group woman is but he's not quite the the sari is today and so for background purposes this year saxon moro winner of the 2000 guineas and uh, leading two-year-old of last year who's now retired and is off to cornwall stud he's by deep impact out of a galilea mare 
and um, the other leading horse of, of the year, Study of Man, who won the French Derby. Uh, he's also by Deep Impact, but from a fantastic Nyarkos family of Miesk, uh, and is out of a storm cat mare, so it's arguably a more interesting pedigree than Saxon Moria. But anyway, we've, this, was, uh, this, this girl, the dam, Sunday Best, is out of a Chilean Group 1 winner. It's a bit of a funny page, um, and I was always taught... Uh, in my uh, rearing that I should never buy anything from a South American family, that it was all Mickey Mouse form and that you should just avoid it like the plague. Anyway, I got off the plane and jumped into Harris Sweeney's car, drove for about seven years and got to a stud farm. And this and Sunday Best was the first filly I saw when I got out of the car and she was an absolute belter. Anyway, we bought her, she came over here and she promptly split her pastern when she was in training, so that was great. And that's why it says winner of one race at four. Um, anyway, cut a long story short, she was a bit disappointing. Uh, anyway, this boy was the second foal. The first foal by Packer Boy was very small. Packer Boy had a very good year at that stage. And um, so we wanted to inject a little bit of size. And I think we achieved that with this, with this boy who came up here where John got involved and we brought him together for 55,000 guineas. Uh, as one of a group of horses owned by um, uh, Princess Hire. So I think that's a good moment to hand over John, who can just tell us a bit about what maybe you liked about him as a yearling, maybe. I think, Anything. first of all, uh, quickly look at the pedigree. Compare the last horse, Arod, and compare him to the pedigree on Style Hunters. So we always start by looking at the catalogue. We go through the catalogue before we see a horse as to what families. You will notice that Arod has great depth in his family. I was rather sad when it said a long time ago, the third dam. If you look under that, Anne O'Connor. I trained Anne O'Connor in America in the 1980s. So that um, it's always worrying when you find him under the third dam, the fourth dam, and even the fifth dam. You realize that the years have ticked by and the OAP status is well known. But uh, she was lovely, Billy won three grade ones. But what I have point I'm making about his pedigree, it has serious depth at group one level at top tracks. When you get to this boy, Style Hunter, you roar down to the third dam, and all you find is Chilean group ones. Having been years ago to Chile with my wife and uh, seeing the racing there, it's, um, it's not quite our level, and they run an awful lot of group, group ones. A bit like Australia, they seem to have about five a weekend. He is by Raven's Pass. Raven's Pass stands at Kildangan, one of the studs that uh, obviously is related to the um, owner of this horse. And secondly, uh, I trained Raven's Pass. He won the Breeders' Cup Classic, you might remember him. And he also was champion miler here in, in, in Europe. So he was somewhat a favorite of ours. He, is a, he was a light-framed horse at the sale and a little bit narrow, but he was a smooth, easy mover, which he still is. He's been a very sound horse. He had a nice outlook, and we were trying to buy something at a lower price, and 55,000, I'm afraid, is a lot of money, but in the sales ring, when you're trying to buy nice yearlings, it's, it's the bottom end of the market. Anything from 25 to 55, you can then get into the 75, 100, and 125 range, and it goes on and up from there. But we were delighted with him. He's been a pleasure to train. First run at Newmarket, poor boy got crashed into by another horse and gashed his leg open, most unusual. So he was off for uh, some time. And we brought him back gently. And he's worked his way through winning at Yarmouth, through to a handicap at Goodwood. He's now a hundred rated horse and uh, 108 on time form. He was meant to run yesterday. He went to Newbury and then the heavens opened and the ground went soft, which like his father, Raven's Pass, and like his grandfather, Deep Impact, they like fast ground, top of the ground. This horse is no exception. Consequently, we withdrew him. So he came up here. He's very confused as to what's happening this weekend. He's seems to be taking little bus trips everywhere. And uh, he's with us now, and I'll uh, leave him in the Cambridgeshire. He probably won't get in, but he'll run in the Silver Cambridgeshire. So he, he's been a pleasure to train. He's a touch of a thinker. Uh, we do have a little semi-blinker on him now, because he's inclined to lose focus, rather like some of us in life, just go a little bit uh, meandering off piste. If you look at him as an individual, do you want Let's to stand him stand up a him sec? Up. When you stood in behind him, he did lack width of his hip. 
and he was a little, little narrow in front, which was not ideal. However, they do mature and change. He wouldn't have been the, f the first one I'd have picked. He's still, he has enough width of his hips, so if you actually face him to the rostrum, and we can see, everyone can see from the hind end, he has enough width of hip now. It's not uh, magnificent, but he's a light-framed horse. And again, the front has developed, and I never raced him early because of his sheer immaturity. His father was a very good two-year-old, won the Solario in track record time. And um, the other thing I liked about him, more than anything, was he had a nice length of rein, that's his neck, good outlook, a genuine nice look outlook, though I put semi-blinkers on. This country has a prejudice against blinkers. In America, we'd race 12 horses in a race, eight would have blinkers. And it's probably not a well-known fact that the great northern dancer, sire of the whole line, the whole line that's prepotent here through Sadler's Wells and Galileo. Northern Dancer won the Kentucky Derby under an old friend of mine who's no longer with us, Bill Hartack, wearing blinkers. And the incomparable Secretariat, also the great Triple Crown win and the greatest horse, they say, other than Man of Water Race in America, also raced in blinkers. So we, I don't have a prejudice against it. I just hope it helps him focus. He has now a good depth. So if you look at his girth, and swing him the other way so people see as well, please. Thanks so much, Annalee. Uh, he's got enough depth of girth. He was never a horse who was, he was a touch shallow and immature, but he has enough depth of girth now. In, in front, he's a little offset of the knees, so instead of facing straight at you, they're a little bit angled out. But he has been a sound horse. He was a good light mover. You could see he's a top of the ground horse just the way he moves. He doesn't pick him up and put him in. He just floats easy over the ground and low, smooth. Um, hind leg is, 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 is a decent enough hind leg. Push him back one there, Annalee. His hocks aren't too far behind him, just a shade. Uh, the foot, he's got a decent foot. You don't want too small a pinchy foot, too shallow a foot, too shelly a foot. He was good in that area. Correct confirmation of the leg. He's correct through the knee. He's neither over at the knee, which I'm never mad about. They say they never break down, but I find they're slow on the hall. Back at the knee, as was being explained, was in this sort of angle slightly back. If you watch a slow motion film and freeze it of a horse galloping, it will stagger you when they go forward and come over with a weight over the top, how far back the knee actually goes. One of them round again now. The other thing when you're buying yearlings and looking at yearlings, it, it's not unlike when you meet a person. Look them in the eye, look in their face, and just look at their disposition and their outlook and the way they carry themselves, the feeling, the message you get from that. Vincent O'Brien was fascinating when he went to a sale. He was particularly very certain what pedigrees he was interested in. So say there were 200 in the sale, he'd probably only look at 25 of them. The other pedigrees didn't interest him, but he would send stand there forever looking at the horse's head and eye. I think he was just filling in time sometimes. But in truth, he wanted to know what the character of that horse was. And we're always looking for a good outlet, broad forehead, good eye. We like a bigger ear on a horse. And Abel, for instance, has enormous ears. We've always, Henry Sessa always loved that in fillies. Just those little things down the years. We want the depth, we want the movement, we want the length of rein, they want enough length over the back, we want enough hip to tail. So from the hip of the horse to the tail, there's enough strength there. And uh, to that extent, uh, and you're looking for the forearm and the gaskin we were talking about earlier, but remember you're buying a baby, they're a yearling, and they do change dramatically, and they mature, and some grow, and some forget to grow. And the other thing I was just going to bring up, which is interesting for you to comment on, of course, is that, is that when you're, th there's a lot of horses that go through this ring that are not all perfect. This is the whole point about, like, most of us aren't perfect. The, the important thing is to realise, yes, when a horse walks out and you see him or her for the first time, and John's absolutely right, something that we often talk about, it's like meeting a person for the first time. You often know whether it's a boy or a girl, whether you're going to hit it off straight away or whether you like the, the cut of them. Um, it's the same with animals, and I think it's the same if you meet a dog or a cat, quite frankly, it's a simple uh, way of putting it. But 
the, the other thing is w when you're here trying to buy a horse, for example, for 55,000 guineas, you have got to tolerate faults. So when, when John's talking about the, the hocks, either the point of the hind leg being slightly behind, that's something you have to wear if you're buying a horse for less than 100 grand. If he's not quite perfect of a knee, it's something you're going to have to tolerate. If you're walking in here with 700,000 quid, fine. That's, that's easy to... to, to um, to, to take for granted almost that a horse is nearly, you know, 85, 90% confirmationally correct. But when you're buying on a budget, it's one of many factors you have to take into account, not just confirmation, but also pedigree. Have you got something to say about that when you're trying no, to No, I think it's very logical. We call look, the longer you're in this game, the more you realize there are no rules. That once you know a family and then they run with a certain fault, you forgive it. It's a matter of looking at them for years and years and seeing the families and the traits coming through. And I prefer to say that probably the finest horses I've trained in my life have confirmation faults. There's no such thing as a perfect horse. I remember once looking at horses years ago with my wife at Fasig Tipton, uh, the pal of mine, and we looked at this horse and we were right, trying to show with a certain fault. So we got to this horse and we looked at it. For five minutes, we never said a word. And Rachel said, what's wrong with him? He's too perfect. <laughs> and funny enough, the horse turned out not wanting to try. So there you are, your perfect confirmation you didn't want to try. But you do learn a lot down the years about faults to forgive, faults they can live with. And the way they move is so important, how they put the foot down.